Yeah, we'll just open in prayer and then we'll go into the presentations. Um, would anyone like to open us in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for this uh, for this beautiful day uh, that you have blessed us with. And uh, and Lord, as we're going to start on our classes, I pray, Jesus, that you would um, help those who are presenting and that they would do the best and they would do it well. And uh, thank you, Lord, that we will have a good time together. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll um, maybe begin. I, I didn't actually look at the order in which we we'll be going today so um shall we just do chira and then uh, prince and then nina we'll do in that order okay uh, so chira you can start with your presentation and then we'll have the others present yes ma'am okay Uh, can you help me to present my presentation? Okay, uh, you'll just have to share screen. Uh, do you know how to share your screen? On the bottom, um, in the center, there are a few buttons. One of them says present now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you click on that. Yes, ma'am and then select uh, whichever window you want to present. So on the top, click on window and then select. You might have to first start sharing the presentation, right? I mean, uh, OK, OK, I usually do the opposite. You have your presentation open already? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh. Ma'am, uh, yes, Chira. I think you're sharing your Chrome uh, window. So when you said share, there are three options on the top. There's a, I think it says Chrome, and then it says, uh, yeah, it says Chrome tab, window, or entire screen. So you have to choose window. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. I got it. Yeah. And then click on the presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We can see it now. You'll just have to uh, start the presentation. Okay. Okay. So, ma'am, uh, uh, my voice is okay, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Uh, are you able to switch on your camera, Chira? Yeah, sure, ma'am, sure. Yeah. Is it yeah. good, ma'am? All good? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's me, Chira, and I'm going to say about Sadhu Sundar Singh today. So Sadhu Sundar Singh, he refers as a postal with the breeding feet. And we're going to see a little about his little about Sadhu Sundar Singh. So, one second, ma'am. It's uh, my presentation is not going. Uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, Anand. So, what you'll do is you just uh, cancel the uh, share screen. And just uh, do share screen for the whole for the whole uh, screen. Then you go to the your presentation, and then it will be it will come as presentation. You just uh, go back. Okay, so I have to stop this sharing, right? Right. Sorry. 
I have to uh, stop this one. Ah, uh, first end end the present end the presentation. Uh, okay, so okay. you just uh, first share screen. Share screen. And then there is a third option, entire screen. Okay, so Chrome I share this one. window and entire screen is there, right? So you choose entire screen. Yeah. Uh, now it will. Okay, but I can't see myself, right? No, you, you don't have to see yourself. You have to see okay. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry for like this messy things. Okay, are you start again, ma'am? <laughs> Yeah, please start again. Okay, start again. Okay, okay. Hi, once again, good morning, everyone. It's me, Shira, and I'm going to share about Sadhu Sundar Singh. And Sadhu Sundar Singh, he was referred as a postal with bleeding feet. So we're gonna see a little about his uh, about Sadhu Sundar Singh. So Sadhu Sundar Singh was born 3 September 1889 in Rampur, Punjab. Sadhu Sinder Singh was born into a Sikh family, the village called Rampur. His mom wanted him to be a holy man who lived in the jungle some miles away from uh, away like Sadhus. His mom wants that he should love his religion. In the very young age, he started reading Bhagavad Gita. So these are some timeline about Sadhu Sinder Singh's journey. In 1889, born at Ludhiana, Punjab, Rampur, 1903, conversion, conversion 1904, cast out from home, and 1905, baptized in Simla, 1907, work in leprosy hospital at Sabatu, 1908, first visited to Tibet, and 1909, entered Divinity College, Lahore, to train for the ministry. So, Sadhu had prayed. Christianity or their God, like Jesus Christ. He was, he don't like Jesus, so he met Jesus in mission school, even Christian high school. When even people tell him to read Bible, that time, he used to get angry. He tore the New Testament pages in, in front of all people. And after, he left the mission school and he started studying in government school. And then he used to throw stones and mud to missionaries and preachers. He burned one book of New Testament in front of all people. But as fiercely as he opposed Jesus Christ, the more he became troubled and restless in his heart. And then he started reading Bible. So now we're gonna see his encounter. Sadhu resolved to kill himself by throwing himself upon a railway track and he asked that whosoever is true god will appear him before appear before him or else he will kill himself that very night he had encounter with jesus through vision from that day his whole life was changed and when we come to a spiritual journey after the vision he went to his father and announced that he will get converted into the missionary works of Jesus Christ. Then his father officially rejected him because he converted and his whole family went against him. Even his brothers attempted to poison him many times. He was poisoned, but God saved him. And the people of near area, they threw snakes into his house. But he was rescued with the help of the Christian, nearly Baptist Christians. So, in uh, he got baptism on the 16, his 16th birthday in 1905. He was publicly baptized as a Christian in the parish church in Simla. Now we're gonna see his missionary journey. Sadhu said. I am not worthy to follow in the steps of my Lord, he said, but like him, one no home, no positions. Like him, I will belong to the Lord, sharing the suffering of my people, eating with those who will give me shelter and telling all men the love of God. This was the statement of Sadhu Sindar Singh. And then 
when we uh, see his missionary journey sadhu sundar singh travel north word of missions mission of converting through the punjab kashmir and the back through muslim country afghanistan and into the brigand infest northwest frontier and bulak bulakistan he was referred to as the apostle with bleeding feet by the Christian community of the North. In 1908, he crossed the frontier of Tibet, where he appeared by the living condition. And he was stoned and he bathed in cold water because it was believed that holy men never washed. So according to Sadhu Sundar Singh, in a town called uh, Rasar, he had been thrown into a dry well full of bones and rotting flesh and left to die. But after three days, he was rescued. During his 20s, Sadhu Sundar Singh gospel work wilded grandly and long before he was 30, his name and picture were familiar all over Christians. In 19 then he made a long tour of South India and Ceylon and the following years he was invited to Burma, Malaysia, China and Japan for ministry work. And in 1920 he visited Britain, the United States and Australia. And 1922 he visited Europe. So through this journey and through his missionary journeys there is men, uh, thousands and thousands of people that receive Christ. And as I told that he called as an apostle with bleeding feet. And there is one mystery about Sadhu Sundar Singh. No one knows that where, how he died, what happened to him. In 1929, Sundar Singh determined to make one last journey to Tibet. Against all his friends' advice, he was last seen on the 18th of April 1929, sitting off on his journey. In April, he reached Kalka, a small town below Simla. A prematurely aged figure in his yellow robe, a monk, pilgrim, and holy men who were beginning their own trek to one of Hinduism, holy place some miles away where he went after that he was unknown whether he died or exhaustion or reached the mountain remains a mystery no one knows some say that sadhu was murdered and his body thrown into the river and from that day he was seen no more so this was the about sadhu sinder Singh. And still no one knows like how he died. This was just mystery. Thank you. Thank you, Chida. We have uh, Prince present next.
Um, is it sharing? Is it sharing? Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, can you guys uh, hear me? Can you just give me uh, confirmation that you can hear? Yeah. They can hear me. Uh, so um, my name is Prince Munadeep. I'm your fellow classmate. Uh, I'm gonna share a presentation on uh, uh, Jonathan Goforth. So uh, uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm gonna share about the, his background. Uh, his family, uh, his studies, and then uh, we're gonna look about his uh, marriage and his family, his spiritual life, and uh, call for his call for ministry. And then we're gonna see, uh, look at, uh, look his work and his contribution for ministry and uh, his part in uh, China revival. So, go, uh, Jonathan, go forth. Uh, Jonathan Goforth he is a passionate, tireless pastor and evangelist of the revivalist. Uh, he was from he was the first uh, Canadian Presbyterian missionary to China, and uh, he he served for forty seven years in his uh, his missionary journey. Uh, he was born. Yeah, Jonathan uh, Jonathan Goforth was born in uh, February 10, 1859. He is the seventh child to his parents. His parents immigrated from England to Canada and settled near Western Ontario in 1840. His parents were pioneers of farmers and were exposed to many physical hardships and uh, had to practice the utmost economy. He, uh, Jonathan completed his uh, high schooling in Hampsford, or, uh, Ontario. He attended the University of Toronto and uh, at Knox College and graduated in 1887. In, 18, in 1950, he was awarded the Doctor of Divinity. Uh, during his uh, training in uh, Knox College uh, and uh, during uh, his uh, first missionary uh, ministry with Knox College, he met uh, he met Rosalina Bell Smith at his training uh, in Toronto Union Missions. She was born in London. She was grown up in Canada. Uh, Jonathan proposed her by asking, will you marry, will you join your life with me for China? Instead of buying her an engagement ring, he purchased books and pamphlets on China to distribute in his college along with him. Uh, uh, Jonathan and uh, Rosalind married in 1887. They had uh, 11 children, only six of them survived childhood. Foundation in the world, uh, even though their parents were uh, exposed to many uh, economic, many financial situations and struggles, uh, his mother 
was very faithful in teaching scriptures to him. She used to make him uh, uh, attend to church and uh, make him read the word every day. And when Jonathan was seven years of age, he received a Bible from a lady. And at the 10, uh, he came under the deep conviction of sin. And he need, and he need, uh, he came to the conviction that he needs, that he is in need of salvation. But no one asked him to make a decision for Christ. Later, Jonathan uh, uh, joined in a Presbyterian church while he was uh, listening to the sermon of Pastor Cameron, he was deeply convinced and uh, he dated his uh, conversion from a service where he attended when he was 18 years of age. And he responded to the preaching of Cameron and he responded to the appeal for decision to follow Christ. Sense of calling. During the year of his youth, he often debated with himself whether he should be a teacher or a politician. His pastor, Mr. Reverend Mr. Cameron, invited Jonathan to his home for instruction in the scriptures, and that helped him to prepare to enter Knox College in Toronto to pursue his uh, education. One day while he was in college, he heard missionary George Lindsay Mackey of Formosia presents the claim of Christ for the, the mission field in the most forceful way. Jonathan described that meeting in a few words. He described that, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will go for us and whom shall we send? And uh, his response is, here I am, send me. From that hour, I began a foreign missionary. He lost no opportunity to, pre to prepare himself for the mission field and to declare the claims of Christ and the needs of uncivilized, uncivilized multitudes and unevangelized too. Jonathan started his first ministry in 1885, serving with Toronto Mission Union. They, where he used to go and preach gospel on the streets and pray for children and the people on the streets. In 1885, Jonathan received a copy of Hudson Tyler's book, China's Spiritual Need and Claims. He was deeply impressed and was formed that, and from that time on, Within, with renewed dedication, he began to pray that a door would open for him to go to China and minister. On October 25th, the same year, Jonathan Goforth was ordained as a pioneer missionary to China. On February 4th, 1988, they, he, Jonathan, along with his wife, sailed for China. By the middle of the September of the same year, they were, overlooking, they were looking over their mission field in provenance of Hona. It was soon evident that Go uh, Jonathan Goforth was a man sent from God. He was untiring in his evangelistic services and efficient in the training of national workers and the establishing of churches under the leadership of many Chinese Christians. Manchurian Revival. In 1904 and 1905, as he inspired by the news of great Welsh revival and read Charles Finney lecture on revivals. In, 1900, in, nine, in 1907, circumstances brought him to witness the Korean revival. As Goforth returned to China through Manchuria in, in, 18, in 1908, congregation invited him back. During his extended visit there, the Manchurian revival broke out. The first such revival to gain a national wide a, a national wide publicity in China as well as internationally. The revival transformed uh, Goforth's life 
and ministry. From then on, he was primarily primarily an evangelist and a revivalist, not a settled missionary. The efforts of revival in China reached overseas and contributed to some tensions among Christian de de denominations in the United States, fueling the fundamentalistic modernistic controversies in the Presbyterian Church in United States of America. During this time of revival, many were deeply convinc convinced of sins and convicted of their sins, and hundreds of back backsliders were joined the church. Jonathan Goforth comforted campaigns in 30 different cities, and after he would and after he would conclude the campaign, he would after he would con conclude his work in a city. The revival fire would continue to spread as a team of Chinese evangelists would be sent out from the local churches that experienced the revival into the surrounding countryside, producing a harvest wherever they went. These are some of the results of the Chinese revival. Both of hymns during this revival, old hymns were sung with a new and extraordinary flavor and meaning, and new hymns were being written. They were hymns of confession and hymns of pardon through the precious blood of the anointment, and hymns expressing human need and heavenly peace. The spirit of intercession was poured out on the churches during the following the revival, people would spend long periods of time in private prayer. The national awakening that followed in revival doubled the Protestant population in China to a quarter of a million. The Lord used Jonathan Gofford to spark the revival, but the fire of the revival was kept blazing by the leaders of Chinese believers who were ignited in the revival. During this revival, uh, many people were sent out and uh, encouraged to establish the churches. And the Manchurian Chinese church was established during this revival. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. So I will start now. Hi. Hi, good morning all. I'm going to share about William Joseph Seymour, uh, who started his life from 1780 to 1922, was one of the most influential men in the birthing of the modern Pentecostal movement. This, his, leadership was, his leadership and participation in the Azusa Street Revival at the beginning of 1900s sparked the growth of a global awakening to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and a large missionary sending movement. Born to a former slaves in 1870, he had a humble upbringing in Center Villa, Louisiana, amidst of much poverty and devastation, but 
humility was a character that marked Seymour's life. In his early 20s, he traveled throughout the Midwest working as a hotel waiter. While in Indianapolis, he attended a church and surrendered his life to the Lord fully for the first time. And in 1902, when in Ohio, he contract, contacted smallpox and lost vision in one eye. Eventually, Seymour's journeys led him to Houston. There he met Charles Farhan, who was then leading a Bible school in that city. Because of the segregation laws of the time, Seymour was not able to officially attend the school, but his hunger for God compelled him and he could sit in the hallway outside of the classroom door in order to learn as much as possibly could. While in Houston, he was frequently involved in evangelistic outreaches in the black area of town. So in 1906, he was invited to become the pastor of a small holiness church. Seymour's arrival in Los Angeles created a small stir in the holiness community there because of his bold preaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. After about a month in the city, he arrived at the church to teach at the Sunday evening service to find that the door was locked. <clears throat> but his seal was not damned and soon he gathered several people and started a prayer meeting in a friend's house on Bonnet Brave Street. The first gatherings were attended primarily by a few African-American washwomen and their husbands. But within a month, these humble prayer meetings had exploded. The Holy Spirit had begun to anoint this gathering and many people started to pray and sing in tongues. The exponential growth soon caused the uh, group to make a large uh, move to a larger building <clears throat> in 312 Azusa Street. This was the beginning of what became known as the Azusa Street Revival. People streamed to these meetings from all over the nation and eventually the world to witness and to be part of these meetings. Many were saved, many were healed, both in body and in soul. Many spoke in tongues and many received strength and encouragement to continue to live in holiness. This movement did not just stay within the walls of Azusa Street Mission Building. Within nine months, many missionaries were, were already being sent throughout the west coast of United States and 13 missionaries departed for Africa. Just two years after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in 1906, missionaries commissioned in Azusa Street Mission could be found in Mexico, Canada, Western Europe, the Middle East, West Africa and several countries in Asia. <clears throat> the Azusa Street legacy was formed and fashioned many influential leaders in the body of Christ over the past century. Uh, the spiritual life of uh, Simo. Simo was a man intensely hungry for God. This made him begin fasting and praying as a part of his life from a very early life. A man of great humility, William Simo was the face and de facto leader of the Azusa Street Revival and the testimonies of those around him who saw his life attest to his character. Frank Berth Berthman, his co-labor and fellow leader described him by saying, he was a very plain, spiritual and humble. Brother Seymour generally sat behind two empty shoe boxes, one on top of the other. He usually kept his head inside the top uh, during the prayer meetings. There was no pride there. And another pastor from Chicago who traveled to Azusa Street, his description of Simo was this. He walk and talk with God. His power is in his weakness. He seems to be maintain a helpless dependence on God and is as simple and uh, as a little child. And at the same time, is he's so filled with God that you feel the whole the love and power every time you get near him. Prayer seems to have been the foremost activity of the Azusa mission. One particip participant said, the whole place was steeped in prayer. Simo spent much of his time behind the pul pulpit praying. An unpretentious man 
he recognized his own need for the continual guidance and strength of the Holy Spirit. John G. Lake described William Seymour with these words, God had put such a hunger into, into that man's heart that when the fire of God came, it glorified him. I do not believe any other man in modern time had a more wonderful dialogue of God in his life than God gave to that dear fellow. And the, and the glory and the power of a real Pentecost swept the world. That black man preached to my congregation of 10,000 people when the glory and power of God was upon his spirit and men shook and trembled and cried to God and God was in him. William Seymour was a man fully surrendered to God and the Lord used him mightily to bring about a major awakening to early 20th century in America and eventually to the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, just a few more minutes. We'll try and cover because we are quite behind on our content. Uh, we'll try and cover how much ever we can. Okay, so uh, everyone who presented today presented on um, revivalists who were in the 1900s. So we are going back because we haven't yet reached the 1900s in our uh, textbook. So we'll just be looking at some of the uh, revivalists from the late 1800s into the 1900s. Uh, so we start with Charles Spurgeon. So Charles Spurgeon was known for his preaching. He's still very well known today because of his sermons. Um, he was born in England and came to faith when he was still a child. Um, and within uh, and he soon began to start preaching. So after he came to faith, even as a teenager, he had started preaching. Uh, within just one and a half years of starting to preach, he was invited to the New Park Street Chapel uh, to preach at their church. And initially, they liked his preaching, so they asked him to stay, and they said, stay with us for six months and keep preaching. Uh, but eventually, he ended up staying with that church and becoming their pastor. He pastored there for 38 years. Um, the church grew so large that they had to move out of that building into another building called the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. Uh, and that that building could seat up to 5,600 people. So uh, it was through his preaching that people were being drawn to come into the church. Um, he uh, traveled a lot. Uh, preaching. He preached to uh, tens of thousands of people in and around London. Uh, and then his sermons also started to be published in the papers. So the newspapers were publishing uh, his preaching uh, in the London Times and even in the New York Times. So even in the US, uh, the sermons that he was preaching in England were being printed there. Uh, we'll move on. D.L. Moody uh, was... Uh, from the U.S. He was born in 1837, um, and uh, he's one of the most prominent evangelists, so uh, uh, almost seen as a forerunner to, um, uh, oh gosh, who is, uh, to Billy Graham, okay, so uh, because of his evangelism. Uh, so one of the largest evangelists in this last part of the 19th century. Um, so he was from Chicago. He was a shoe salesman. Uh, and simultaneously, while he was selling shoes, he was also teaching in Sunday school uh, and working with the YMCA, which is uh, a young men's Christian association. Uh, so. His Sunday school basically was uh, reaching out to poorer children, right? That was the, what the Sunday school movement did. Uh, so he was uh, teaching uh, poorer children, and his Sunday school classroom started to grow, and there were lots of children who were joining in. Uh, so by 1864, he actually 
uh, started a church because that Sunday school classroom had grown uh, so much. And it was called the Illinois Street Church, which is now the Moody Church. Um, in 1871, uh, there was a fire that burnt down uh, his church. Um, and during this time, he was actually preaching through a sermon series. So it was a six-part sermon series. And he had reached the fifth part. The sixth part was supposed to be preached. Before he could preach that, the, there was a fire in Chicago, and his church got burnt down. At that time, uh, the way the gospel was preached, it was viewed that you have to preach it through over a period of time. You can't just preach it in one sermon and share the gospel to someone. So that's what he was doing through that sermon series. And so in his last sermon, he was actually going to ask people to respond to uh, like what Jesus has done on the cross for them. But because he was not able to preach that sermon, he never got the opportunity to uh, kind of bring that message to the church. Um, after that, he uh, started to preach the gospel just in his regular sermons instead of doing this through a series to just preach it in the sermon and so that changed the way evangelism was done after that people started to just preach the gospel uh, in a single sermon and invite people to respond to the gospel um so while he you he while he was preaching in this church his church was actually a very it was the largest church in chicago and there were many people who were coming to christ uh, through his sermons uh, but while he used to preach there were two women who would sit in the front seat of the church who kept praying for him as he was preaching and they would tell him every sunday after his sermon after the service they would say uh, we've been praying for you uh, and he wondered why, why he, they were praying for him, because the church was doing really well, people were coming to Christ. Uh, but they were praying for him to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and uh, eventually he was going through, he was very, very uh, tired from, let's see if we move in from, yeah. we'll. Uh, so he was very tired from traveling around, preaching and all of that, and so he took a break to go to London, and he had said he would go to London, take a break, and he wouldn't preach at all while he was there in England. Um, but while he was in England, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it completely transformed him. So you see a quote here from him. He says, I had such an experience of God's love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, and yet hundreds were converted. I would no not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience. If you should give me all the world, it would be as the small dust of the balance. So God was using him powerfully before he had this experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it was after this baptism that he saw a much greater increase in the response to his sermons. Uh, although his church was doing really well, uh, there were people coming to Christ. What happened through the baptism was that his, uh, his preaching became that much more powerful, although the content didn't change. Um, so while he was in England, I'll just change slide, uh, he traveled to England to rest, uh, and he Basically, this was a time when he didn't want to preach uh, because he was not very well. So he wanted to take some time and rest. But while he was there, he met um, a preacher named Theophilus Lessie. And uh, that pastor invited him to preach in his church. So he said, OK, since the pastor invited him, he went to preach on a Sunday morning. Uh, but what he didn't know was that there was somebody from that church who had heard about what was happening in uh, in the US through his work and had actually prayed for him to come to their church. Uh, and she was someone who was bedridden, so she was not even going to the church, she, uh, but she was part of the church. And she had been praying that he would come and preach there. So in the first morning service he preached, uh, her sister had attended the service and went back and told her, oh, D.L. Moody came to preach in our church. So she insisted that she would go for the second service, which was in the evening. And uh, during this time, he preached, and there was a great response to the gospel. Uh, people responded. Uh, people came up to the altar to confess their sins and to receive Christ. And from there, there was a revival that broke out. Uh, so this is just to show all the different places that Moody 
Modi traveled to because of what happened in this one church. Uh, so it was during a time when he was supposed to be resting, a time when he was taking a break from ministry. Uh, but God still used him there. And uh, then he started to travel all over UK and Ireland, um, preaching and lots of people uh, were attending these meetings and coming to Christ. There was a growth in the church uh, in, in all of these parts. Uh, in 1879, he started a seminary for young women and also a school for boys. And this uh, was mostly for educating uh, poor children and for educating minorities. Uh, and then in 1886, he started uh, a Bible school and he also started a summer school, which was for training um, young people who want to go into missions. Uh, so that school within, so from 1886 to 1911, had sent about 5,000 student volunteers, had trained about 5,000 student volunteers and sent them out on missions uh, to different parts of the world. So I think we are out of time. Uh, we'll try and catch up on all of these other revivalists next week. Um, but thank you to all of you who presented. I think we only have one presentation left, uh, which is probably next week. Thank you.